Gender Studies in Religion and Violence, and she's received a very long list of research grants and awards, which I won't read out because probably the names aren't known to people in the room. Um, personally, I'm incredibly grateful to Dr. King for the secret revelation of John, which I think to this day stands as the, the single um, most detailed and accessible book on perhaps the most important text in the whole National Mighty Corpus. Cool. Um, but in general, for your, I you mean, know, okay, but, so Dr. King's joke that we were talking before is that her entire career has come out of a jar. <laughs> 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 because in pursuing those interests, most of the text that she's looked at is, is from the, the Gnostic books of that, that early part of, of Christian history. So, um, without further ado, and with tremendous gratitude, I'd like to welcome Dr. Karen King to speak to us today. Well, thank you for the generous introduction and my jar joke. <laughs> both like. um, it's really an honor for me to be among you today. Uh, I particularly want to thank Father uh, Donato for the invitation, the gracious invitation to come, and also my student Clark Aikens, who I think many of you know for, uh, I should say, almost former student. He's getting ready to graduate this spring, um, but for what he's taught me through his work and through conversation. So the Apocryphon of John opens by telling us what it is, by talking about its nature. It says, the teaching of the Savior and the revelation of the mystery, together with the things which are hidden in silence, and those things which the Savior taught to John, his disciple. So the whole book is a revelation of the mystery. It's all things hidden in silence. So these things that are hidden in silence are now being taught by the Savior to his disciple John. We see how topics about mystery and about secrecy, about what is hidden and about revelation are there right from the very beginning. In the title itself, which although the, you may know that the title in the actual manuscript comes at the end, we stick it up front. But basically, this is where the text starts. This is what it tells us about um, these things. So one may think, OK, fine, this is a revelation. We know what that is. But what I want to suggest is that the language of mystery and secrecy in this text is actually very complex. Um, and I want to talk with you about that complexity. So there are many complexities. So I'm going to start by giving you my list, <laughs> okay? But don't worry because we're going to then come back, okay, and look at each one in more detail in turn. But I want to give you a sense right from the beginning about some of the things this text does. So the language of mystery and secrecy is used to characterize the story, the whole contents. We just saw that, you know? It's these are revealed teachings from the Savior. So at one level, mystery and secrecy are the whole thing the book, the physical, even artifact itself, but certainly the entire context. It's also used to teach readers to be alert to the hidden meanings of scripture, tradition, and history. So if for the readers, there are things hidden. Okay. Uh, and not in the text itself, but in scripture, in tradition, in history, and events around one. It also is used to expose the deceptions of the lower world rulers. Why is it that we haven't, we haven't understood what's going on? How is this being made? So to expose the deception of the lower world rulers. It's used to differentiate the immovable race, that is to say those who receive the truth of this revelation, from those who are still under the sway of the counterfeit spirit. So those who are still under the sway of evil powers and of ignorance. It's used to characterize how the revelation is given. It is given in a mode of secrecy, okay? Its theophanic mode of disclosure is one of mystery. It's used to characterize the ineffable nature of God, okay? God is mystery, okay? Because of the ineffability, okay? Um, 
it's used to disclose the power of true names, knowing the true names of things which have been hidden now are exposed. It's used to describe how strategies of concealment and deception are used for defense and for offense. It's very interesting because this is not just, you know, deception is not just used by the lower powers of the world, but um, beings of the upper realm are also, you know, will use deception um, as well as, uh, as, uh, as truth and concealment. And so sometimes that um, secrecy, concealment, deception <coughs> are used to lead humanity astray and sometimes to save them. It is used also to offer social critique and protection, the kind of protection that indeed might arise from the fact that one's doing pretty strong social critique of the structures and powers of the world the way it is. And finally, <laughs> I'll make sure that was the final one, um, I think it's used uh, to teach uh, practices of silence. One might think of those ritually, one might think of those other kinds of ways, but what is hidden and what is secret is enveloped in silence, and so we'll talk about that. So this is my list. Okay. Um, so let's start with the first one. To characterize the contents, the whole story as revealed from the Savior. So I thought you might like a quick, brief reminder kind of run through of the text. So I'm just going to run you through the secret revelation of John. So the text describes Christ's revelation of God and the divine world, the origins of the universe and humanity, the nature of evil and suffering, the body and sexuality, the path to salvation, and the final end of all things. Well, I, one of the things I love about this text is that it is arguably, okay, which means it is my view, okay, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the first Christian full story of everything. You know, it's the first time you have a story that starts at the very beginning and goes to the very end and includes everything, you know. So this is the first really comprehensive Christian narrative uh, that was written. Uh, so it does everything. Okay? At the heart, I think, of this very deeply spiritual story lies a powerful social critique of injustice and a radical affirmation of God's compassion for suffering humanity. In contrast to the Roman rulers who declared themselves the authors and enforcers of a universal justice and peace, this story describes the world as a shadowed place, ruled by ignorant and malevolent beings. It exposes their lies and viola violence as violation of the true God's purpose and offers sure knowledge of one's true spiritual identity and one's destiny. Divine emissaries frequent this world, this dark world, bringing light, bringing revelation, and working in secret often to lift the soul out of ignorance and degradation and restore it to its rightful place in the world of light. As the story opens, the Savior's disciples, John, is going up to the temple. He encounters a Pharisee named Arimanias, Arimanias is the Persian god who is the sort of dark side. Okay, so this is, so we're supposed to know who this guy is. Okay, so this Pharisee named Arimanias who taunts him, charging that John's teacher has led him astray from the tradition of his fathers and now has abandoned him. John is so deeply disturbed about the Pharisee's charges that he goes out alone into a mountainous place in the desert feeling lost and perplexed. <coughs> Suddenly, the heavens open and the Savior appears to him as a shining light with multiple forms. The mother, the father, the son. The Savior comforts him and reveals to him the entire nature of the universe, which is basically the rest of the text. Okay. He discloses the perfect and utterly transcendent nature of God the Father and describes the appearance of multiple divine beings who derive from him. First of all comes uh, Pranoya Barbalo, the mother, from her, the son, the self-generated Christ, the Autogenes. Autogenes Christ brings forth four great lights, each with three androgynous, male-female, pairs of eternal eons attached to them. And the last of these to appear is Sophia, whose name in Greek means wisdom. 
So we can. So this is like for those of you who read this text. This is the really like super simplification of the divine world. Okay, but so here's the the you know the father, the invisible spirit, Pranoya, the mother, the autogenes, Christ, her son, and the four great lights. Each of which have then pairs. Okay, and the last of which is Sophia. So Sophia is the last. Um, and she desires to produce a likeness out of herself. She desires, in short, to behave as the father does. Okay? But she acts without the consent of the father or her male consort. That is to say, the male side of her ionic pair. And although her intention is good, she acts in ignorance. Not complete ignorance, but in a lesser knowledge, in a diluted sort of form. And as a result, her product was an ignorant and evil being a lion-faced serpent with eyes that flashed fire. I love that image. Oh. This is the creator god of Genesis. His true name is Yaldabaoth. He's also called the chief ruler in the text. Um, anyway, possessing only a soul, but not the higher power, the higher spiritual power of Sophia, his offspring is arrogant and ignorant, even of his own mother. So this is, this is the bastard the fatherless child, okay? Possessing only a soul, but not the higher power of the spirit, Sophia's offspring is arrogant and ignorant son's mother. I said that, okay. His first act is to steal some of her spirit in order to create seven minions who serve him along with a host of angels and archangels. And Yaldabaoth, along with them, then shapes the lower world. Although he uses the divine realm as a pattern, the lower world is, is deficient like its creator. So he looks above, but he creates something that is deficient. So you can imagine this, this god and his archons as also filling in the, the sense of the, of the planetary spheres, the lower world um, as such. The chief ruler demonstrates his profound ignorance by boasting, I'm a jealous god and there's none except me. Well now when Sophia hears this lie, she realizes her error. This is the point where she becomes enlightened and she repents. Now, in an attempt to comfort her, the Elogenes Christ descends to instruct the lower revelation. And here we start really keying into Genesis. Now, I've argued, for those of you who have read the book, that this text, you know, people think that it's now that we're really getting into Genesis. But arguably, the whole Genesis story has already been told above. Because the true father gazes upon his light reflection, which is the light on the water. It's a watery light reflection. And produces, you know, um, the first um, uh, light atom, okay? You may know that in, um, when the Hebrew of Genesis was translated into Greek, this word, it, the word light was translated into phos. And depending on how you, you um, accent phos, it can mean light or it can mean human being. And so these folks are, are, are building on this double meaning, okay? So the light man, the light Adam is the divine Christ above, right? And then you get, again, the patterning of the heavens above. So the Genesis story has already happened properly, so to speak. Now we're getting its lower imitative kind of uh, distorted form, if you will. So the Autogenes Christ des descends to the lower uh, creation and his luminous image, the light Adam, the light man, appears on the water in the form of the human beings and immediately the lower guys, the lower archons, try to possess it. Now, following the Genesis narrative quite clearly, they create a human likeness according to the image that they saw in the waters, but their molded form can't move because it has no life in it. Um, surreptitiously, and this is part of our secrecy thing, sneaky sneaky, the divine lights persuade Yaldabaoth to breathe his breath into the human form. Adam becomes a living being. For the breath of Yaldabaoth turned Adam that was a, in, breathed, it, it takes from, from Yaldabaoth sort of through him so that the breath that goes into Adam through Yaldabaoth is the, is the spirit, the true spirit from above that gives him light and life, and he becomes luminous. And now we see Yaldabaoth as only soul substance, and the spiritually bereft world rulers immediately see that their creator creation is superior <coughs> to them. 
So the thing that should be inferior is actually superior to them. And so they do everything they can um, to, to, to conquer this. They imprison Adam in a body of flesh in order to strengthen their faltering hold over him. One of the things I argue a lot, as those of you who may know, is that this, this fleshly Adam, this flesh is not evil per se. The very fact that Adam in the flesh is luminous means that we're not dealing here, in my opinion at least, with, with a really negative attitude toward the flesh. Um, that's not the problem, although the flesh won't be saved either. But as a result, the human being, this, this um, proto-human being, has spirit from the mother Sophia, soul from the psychic substance of Yaldabaoth and his angels, and flesh from the four elements of the earth. So that humanity is made in the image of divine, but in the likeness of the lower world rulers. And enclosed in matter, Adam becomes ignorant of his nature and origin and becomes subject to suffering, passion, and death. So now we have to save them. So in order to save humanity from this fate, the Divine Mother sends down the female savior, the Epinoi of Light, to instruct Adam. She enlightens him about his true nature and about his, the existence, that there is a divine realm above. The world rulers, of course, sort of they dimly perceive her presence within Adam, but they don't get who she is or where she comes from. So they try to remove her surgically from his side, okay? which results in the birth of Eve, who is called bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. But now Epinoia of the light takes form of an eagle on the tree of knowledge, and she con continues to instruct them both in the true knowledge. The world rulers, having failed yet again, okay, try a new strategy to, dom to maintain their domination over humans, and they invent sexual desire and they trap humanity with reproduction, with food, with wealth, and through labor. At last, Pronoia sends down her own spirit of life to instruct humanity. It, again, it's interesting for me that um, when Adam and Eve reproduce um, Seth, they do so n not according to sexual desire, but they imitate the father's original um, uh, reproductive mode so that when Adam turns to Eve he sees his likeness in her and and that recognition okay of the divine spirit is what is productive of the spiritual child so so again it's 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 done in differentiation from the kind of sexual lust um, that the lower um, rulers are promulgating so at last, Pranoya sends down her own spirit of life to instruct humanity. And the souls who receive her reject the things of this world, and they cultivate the spirit within them. Those who do not become subject to the counterfeit spirit, which binds humanity to the power of the wicked world rulers. So they become free, in a sense. They chain people, the old world rulers, to fate in order to, to blind them further and lead them into sin and suffering. But rather than despair, the Apocrypha of John offers hope in the end for all of humanity, except maybe apostates, okay? In the end, you know, in the, in the, you know, you always wonder, like, everybody hates the, the traitor. Somehow they're, yeah, okay. Um, but all of humanity will be saved and brought into the eternal light. So after a period of instruction and purification, each soul will ascend up to the divine realm and take their rightful places in the eons of the great lights. So in this text, if we talk about, as people have, Gnostic alienation, um, it's not an alienation that signals hopelessness and nihilism, okay? Because salvation awaits all those who recognize the true spirit within, who denounce evil and who grasp the living hope. When Christ has completed this revelation, he commands John to write it down and pass it on to his fellow spirits. So no longer in doubt or in sorrow, John immediately goes forth to his fellow disciples and tells them everything the Savior had revealed, and the book closes. So this whole thing, okay, is mystery and the revelation of hidden things. All right. So that's maybe the easiest thing, not necessarily to understand the text, but to grasp what mystery and secrecy is about. Okay. Now, 
The second point is to teach readers to be alert to the hidden meaning of scripture, tradition, and history. So a good example of this in the text is, for example, the tree of life in Genesis. The Savior teaches them that the rulers enclose the first human in flesh so that humanity becomes mortal and subject to death. And then this lower God places them in paradise. Okay? It's supposed to be fabulous, okay? But the Apocryphon of John, the Savior tells us that it is the place of bitterness, poison, and death. Their tree of life, he explains, is in truth hate, deception, darkness, and evil. Their life is death. Mm -hmm. And what's important here is that the Savior calls this teaching the mystery of their life. So the language of mystery is applied to the life of the lower world rulers and to those who are enslaved by them. Okay? And he describes this life as the counterfeit spirit. So if there is a true spirit, they are promulgating this counterfeit spirit. Okay? So the mystery of their life is in fact the counterfeit spirit. So this is what the reader has to understand. And this counterfeit spirit is also part of the plan, okay? Their mystery is also a plan that they've made, okay, with each other in order precisely to trap humanity, okay? So that's also a kind of secrecy or hidden plan. But you see how it's the counterfeit version of the divine plan, okay? Um, so what we see here is that the true meaning of scripture and tradition Okay, is the exposure of the world ruler's cloak, of their malicious deception, and the Savior supplies um, reality and the truth of reality and exposes how they use partial truths, you know, things that are seemingly the case, that look good, etc., okay, to deceive. So, the real meaning of the Tree of Life is just one example where the Savior's revelation offers the true meaning. There's a whole bunch of other passages, as you probably know, you know, the moving to and fro in Genesis over the waters is the agitation of Sophia when she sees the ignorance of her son and, and, and what he's bringing about. Adam's trance, his sleep, okay, uh, and the creation of Eve from Adam's rib is actually the story of violation and attempted domination. It's not about producing somebody to make a nice companion uh, for Adam and so forth. Um, and of course, this is the case that the subordination of Eve to Adam is also part of their malicious plan. It's, the text says explicitly in the, you know, in, in, in the Berlin version that it is against the plan of the heights, that the, that the female should be subordinate to the male. Okay. So, Often these kinds of explanations are given by the Savior in order to correct the text. Sometimes it indicts Moses, you know, not as Moses said. Or it, it suggests you need to find the, the allegorical or the spiritual interpretation of what's being said. So the, so the literal meaning is not where you stop, but it's where you, it's where you go, <laughs> where you continue. So these cases cue readers to expect scripture and tradition to be full of deception and hidden meaning. So it isn't though as, as though they're the only ones, but now you see it turns the reader into somebody who encounters uh, tradition, and not just biblical tradition, but philosophical tradition, astrological, e everything, okay, with this same sense of where is, where is the deception, where is the truth, okay. Um, and it invites them to see the Savior's revelation as the key to unlock these mysteries. So all of these things are, are again called mysteries, but notice how the, the impact of them being mysteries creates a particular kind of reader. A reader not just of text, but a reader of life. A reader of the world, a reader of the way one goes through, you know, life as it is. Um, now, you can say that the need to question what seems to be literal meaning of the texts, you know, is due to the ignorance of those who produce them, as well as to the deception of the pseudo-deity. Um, but he invites the readers to uncover these truths for themselves. And I think that's an important part of the, of the way in which this, this uh, notion of mystery is working. Um, 
because this whole world, it's not that it's false, it's that it's, a, it's an imitation. It's partial, do you know? Um, so it has, it has these things in it that are actually keys to the way the heavenly world is, right? But now one has to unlock them, okay? So um, it's, this, it's this mimicry and this parody, okay? that are the core of the attitude one should take toward the world. What's being mimicked? What is the truth? What is the, where is the parody? Um, so all of this makes it possible to reread everything. I mean, I mean, at one level, this is just unbelievably, okay, arrogant or something, right? I mean, the audaciousness of saying, you know, we alone have the truth, you know, to reread. But this is a claim that Christians are making generally. You know, um, that the revelation of Christ brings the truth that has not been seen. So the second point, the third or wherever I am, I didn't number these, but the next point is to expose the deceptions of the lower rulers. Okay, I think you can see those already. We're running out of time, so I'm going to move over these. But, but this again is called um, it, the mystery which comes to pass from the holy design above is contrasted with the with the secrecy and mysteries that the lower world rulers have. Okay, so again, you see the imitation, okay, and the deception. Um, next point is to differentiate the immovable race who receives the truth from those who are under sway of the counterfeit spirit. And here, notice the way the Savior calls his teaching the mystery of the immovable generation. Now, this language has been used, as you may know, a lot to argue that these texts are elitist, that some people are saved by nature, you know, so on and so forth. But because everyone is saved in the end, except for those nasty apostates, okay, um, <laughs> then um, <laughs> this immovable generation is a mystery, is for everyone, you know, but people don't know it. So, so this separation is, is in my mind not between those who will be saved and those who won't be saved, like there's, you know, drawing this kind of line, but it's allowing one to see where that line is and to move over it. It's another way to see oneself as part of a group, of a belonging, you know, that is larger, um, a people, a race, okay, and one that is a, a mystery. Okay, a mystery because it partakes of the divine. Okay, in, in this world. Okay, and that language is used at the beginning of the text. It's used at the end of the text. Okay, so it teaches that even those under the sway of the counterfeit spirit are actually members of the perfect race and, and will be saved. Okay, so it seems to me it's not between those who have the truth and those who don't, but it's kind of as a matter of some sort of essence, but it's about timing, where one stands, if you will, in relation to the truth and how one makes the move to stand in proper relation to God. I think also the content of the teaching reinforces the insider view that members of the group um, are not merely those in the know, but are divine, you know, are impervious to the machinations of these vicious powers and their violence that one is destined for eternal salvation in a utopian world of light. So the insider part of this is not just to, to, to is not even perhaps to cast an elitist over against, but it, it is to it is to articulate and contain what that mystery of the movable generation is. It is one's true identity and it is a protection. Okay? Because if you know who you really are, then one knows that these powers, their violence, even death itself, uh, and so on and so forth, um, is not ultimately who one is and one's final destiny in the world of light. Um, the next point is to characterize how the revelation is given. Um, this is very interesting to me because it says that the Savior handed these things over to John um, in a mystery, okay? In Coptic, this is an adverbial form, means mysteriously, okay? Um, what does that mean? And here I think it is the mode of revelation itself, okay, is mystery. 
and it's pointing us back. Now that comes later in the text when, when um, the Savior says he hands over the mystery to John that at, the, at the end, right? But it points us right back to the beginning of the text where you have the, the Savior appearing in the brilliant light, in the forms of the, of the mother, the father, and the son. And so it's a way of encompassing the notion that all of this is done in this mode of mystery, okay? Um, so in, in some ways this notion of how the revelation of Gibbon is also an inclusio of the whole thing. But I think it's very interesting too that the revelation is characterized by the statement that the mysteries are, and I'm back to the beginning of the text, so we floated from the end back to the beginning. The mysteries are things hidden in silence, or things hidden silently, okay? Um, those which he brought to John, his disciple. So the first part of that phrase seems to s imply that silence is a mode of concealment. Um, but the second part states that the hidden things are revealed. So you have this double statement um, that if you, on, on the surface at least, you know, one thinks, oh, well, no, they, they were, okay, hidden, but now they've become revealed. But I actually think that's both true and untrue. That is to say, the text uh, throughout is, um, is asking us to is asking us to take a variety of temporal views in that time, you know? And sometimes those temporal views are the views of the story, which progresses from John, you know, um, John's being disturbed to his being, you know, fine. Sometimes the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's about the view from above, from God's point of view. And here it seems to me, there's no implication that once the mysteries have been revealed, they're no longer hidden in silence. It seems to me they remain hidden in silence. So that what we find out is that the mysteries that revealed have the character of what's hidden in silence, even though they're revealed. So how can that be? Okay. And here's where I think we're asked to think more about the theology of the text. Okay. And about about it taking up the question of epistemology. How can we know? And how can we know God? How can we know um, um, this? And here I think this is another way, this is on my list, to characterize the ineffable nature of God. Now, if one is thinking in ancient philosophical terms, the highest deity is utterly transcendent. You know, so anything one can speak about God is going to be um, is going to be untrue in some sense. And the text uses a variety of different modes when the Savior is teaching about the divine God to talk about he's this and not that. He's both this and that. He, you know, using you know, what will become uh, really foundational kinds of thinking in apophatic theology. Um, and more and more scholars are realizing that that kind of basis in apophatic theology really belongs to this kind of literature. This is where we find it played out most fully earliest, okay? So we have this notion about, about God, okay? So God is ineffable, the Savior teaches, and the divine beings of the heavenly realm come into existence in silence. So existence itself is silence, okay? Those things which really exist are characterized by silence. They can only be known through the one who dwells in God. And the text says, we only know this by those who tell them to us. We're starting to get some, oh, well, it's just not starting, but here's one place where the, the Gospel of John becomes really important. <coughs> okay, I'm going too slow, I'm, I'm speeding up. Okay, how does this happen? Okay, so although the true God is nameless, the name of the Savior is spoken to those who are worthy. So in some ways, the, the, the silent of God is spoken in the name Christ, okay? And so Christ has the knowledge of the all, but Christ is the knowledge of the all, is the appearance of the knowledge of God. So the divine ultimately remains in ineffable silence, but to speak the name of Christ is to reveal the knowledge of the all. 
So it wants to keep both these things true at the same time. Okay. Um, so the name of Christ is both the mode of revelation and it's the content. So silence is itself the content of the revelation at the same time that it is revelation. Okay. I think. Okay. So we also see mystery used to disclose the power of true names. I'm going to skip over this very quickly, but this is very important, I think, because one of the things the Savior does is say things have double names. They're true names and then they're false names. And one of the things that, that the longer text does also is it gives the names of the, of the, the, uh, the daimones who are associated with every part of the human body. And, you know, when the text was found, everybody said, aha, you know, Gnostics hate the body. See, they think it's demonic. Okay. But of course, you know, if you really want to, what you really want is you want to know those demons in order to heal, you know, you know, and, and, and so the names of the demons are in this text for healing and for exorcism and for, for, for exactly for overcoming the malevolent power over the body. Okay, so revelation of, of, the tru of the truth and of proper names, um, you know, is not to despise the body, but to heal it. Okay, and in my view, okay, this is all in my view. I won't say that again. All in my view, in my view. Um, now, um, it's also used to describe uh, strategies of concealment and deception for defense and offense. I talked about this a little bit um, before. Okay, so mystery. Okay, is complemented by stories where beings in the divine world purposefully are hidden. So you see three cases of this, which involve hence at protecting spiritual beings from the malice of the world rulers. So the epinoia of light, for example, hides in Adam. You know, and the hiding there is most certainly in order to protect her from the deception to escape detraction by the world rulers. Later, she lifts the veil of his mind. Okay, so you see what is hidden is unveiled. Um, similarly, um, Pranoya hides, hides Noah and others in a cloud, okay, in order to protect them from the flood of darkness that's unleashed by the world rulers. And in the hymn in the longer version at the end, the Pranoya Christ hides so as not to be recognized when she descends into the world. So all of these cases of being hidden, you know, are about um, remaining um, unknown to enable revelation to humanity while protecting themselves uh, from attacks by the false god and the lower world rulers. But there are other instances of concealment that invoke other ends. Um, the first is when um, Christ tries to hide Yaldabaoth in a luminous cloud, you know, and he escapes. Here it seems that she's ashamed, okay, and she doesn't want anyone to be able to see it, but it isn't possible, okay, to cover up this truth, okay, uh, and he, is, he withdraws and abandons it. So it's an unsuccessful case. Um, there's also a case where the rulers, the lower world rulers, create fate in order to bring about forgiveness and to hide their sins. So here's a case where concealment is, is precisely about, uh, about trying to get away, to hide you know, one's evils. And so in both these cases, you see this with Sophia above, you see it with the rulers below. Okay? And in neither case is it ultimately successful, obviously. Okay? But it also explains why it may be the humans have not been able to perceive the evil of God, of the gods who rule this world, okay? Because fate had blinded the whole creation so that they might not know God. So you see again here, hi hidden and concealment is, um, is used against humanity. Um, so you see this theme of secrecy as deception, okay? Um, where the whole text, of course, is revelation, okay? And you can, you can see again that deception is used on both sides, okay? Um, we saw as before when, the, when, the, um, when they send down the spirit to uh, quicken Adam, that they hide this secretly from Yaldabaoth in order to bring about salvation. So this is a kind of, you know, and it just says quite frankly, they, they deceive him, okay, in order to do this. Um, and so, too, the rulers, okay, uh, want to pollute the souls of humanity with their counterfeit spirit, so they impersonate the legitimate husbands of their victims and molest them, 
okay? Sating them with their faults, spirit and producing children out of darkness. So you get these, these modes of deception um, on all counts. Um, second to last, I promise I'm coming to an end, um, is this issue about social critique and protection, which I said a lot about at the beginning, so I'm not going to say two more. But secrecy can offer um, uh, a lot to a group that is being persecuted, okay? Um, so sociologists often talk about groups, you know, needing to, um, who are offering some new teaching, you know, uh, claiming plausibility or claiming prestige. We have the secret teaching or even profit, you know, uh, and so forth. But it also offers a kind of protection. Um, and this is a very pragmatic strategy. Um, and so I'm using this here to talk about what we, again, this contradiction we seem to have about reveal it to the, only to the members of the immovable race, but everyone is saved. Write it down, but only give it to these. So you, you see this tension, you know. Um, you see it in other Christian texts as well, okay. And so there's some talk about, about, about the strategies of secret societies, you know, being correlated with despotism and police control, you know, this kind of state. So, so one has secrecy in order to protect one in that kind of state. Now, the secret revelation of John depicts the world as dangerous and hostile to human flourishing. And arguably, I think it gains, it gains a, a thoroughgoing critique of power relations in the lower world. So that the world rulers and the Roman rulers and those in charge are, you know, are um, are largely part of this. So it may be that believers require the defense of secrecy not merely because the rulers are bad but because they are engaged in an offensive charge against the world rulers. See, so in other words, it's not that they're being nice, okay? <laughs> they, they have this serious critique going on and in a totalitarian or authoritarian society, I can't say totalitarian, but a really authoritarian society like the Roman world, that would be the case, okay? Um, so secrecy as protection, both as a defense and as an offense against the violent pressure of central powers, okay? Um, now, this is really interesting, of course, because um, one can talk about this for Christians under persecution in the Roman Empire and so forth more generally, but it is the case that as the secret revelation of John and other, those associated with these kinds of texts um, are called heretics by the Christian church, okay, that those notions about secrecy, okay, and, and protection and offense now um, work within Christian society. So it's not as though once Christianity, became, I think, one could make the claim that once Christians became dominant or more dominant in society, they no longer needed to claim the kinds of secrecy they had. But this may not be true for groups that were themselves the subject of prosecution, you know, uh, and even, uh, even torture and, and, and killing, okay, uh, as quote unquote heretics and so on and so forth. So um, secrecy has this kind of, of impact as well. And finally, the notion of using um, mystery and secrecy to teach practices of silence. Um, I think that this text is, is understanding silence as a mode of knowing, that it becomes a kind of pedagogical practice, you know, um, that was, that, you know, silence alone is sufficient for the unspeakable mystery of the my mysteries. Um, so what does silence look like? okay, when one is practicing this. Um, the immediate aim, I think, of these ritual practices or spiritual practices of silent is not to conceal particular content. It's not to not tell anybody about or to read the text as such. Um, but, that, but it is a way of embodying the fact that the teaching itself can't be communicated verbally, you know, um, to substantiate its mystery and to substantiate it ritually as a collective silence, you know, is an, is an acknowledgement of, of, 
uh, again, of, of the way of the ineffability of God and to partake of that ineffability through one's own individual and collective practices of silence. So the emphasis on the mysterious character of the teaching is reiterated in bodily practices like writing, speaking, hearing, but also keeping silence. And it seems to me this is, an, this is a really important part of the text. So it's, it's creating readers who are able to, set, to look past the literal and the obvious for the hidden and the meaningful. It's people who are able to understand um, a, a critique of the violence of power um, in this world, and yet not, to, not precisely to be alienated and to despair and to nihilism, but to have deep, rich, and secure kind of hope you know, and action, to move toward uh, purification and so forth. So in summary, the themes of mystery and secrecy point to multiple meanings and strategic rhetorical kinds of functions. So mystery refers not just to the content of the revelation, but its mode of disclosure. It indicates an interpretive method for deciphering the true meaning of scripture and tradition and history, for interpreting events in a world that is created and ruled by ignorant and evil powers. Secrecy points to strategies of concealment and deception, which are used by everybody, but it also encompasses the text's theological mode of knowing, a mode of knowing of divine ineffability, and a way of being empowered by knowing the true names of things. Together, these, I think, help clarify not only the truth revealed by the Savior, but also how and why that truth had not been uncovered before now. They work, I think, strategically to aid the text's larger aims of shaping readers who are persuaded to accept Christ's teaching as a paradigm, a paradigm that will aid in distinguishing between the true and the false, the real and the counterfeit, life and death. So that's my thoughts on secrecy and mystery. Can I, can I just commend you on your grasp of passing the time? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There's That's also a very rare and precious gift. You there's need also the yeah, there's yeah, also the clock thing. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually like talking with people, so I try to limit natter natter because I know what I'm going to say. So, yeah. We didn't, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, I want to thank you a lot because it's a I mean, secret. John is it's such a fascinating, multi-layered, complex text, and I. I'm grateful to you for the book and for that presentation because I think one of the gifts you give us is you bring in these layers of fine distinctions that help the, the less experienced reader of the text to be able to parse it apart and make sense of it. And that, that kind of conceptual structure helps to, I mean for us, you know, when you're speaking to an academic audience, people are trying to understand it as a, as a piece of historical text. For us, we're trying to use it as a, as a ground for spiritual work. I think one of the gifts you, you give the academic reading of the text is also to make it accessible to people to use it in spiritual life. So I think it's an enormous it's an enormous gift you give us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've always got the first question. So I, I, first of all, I would like to, to thank you as well for just a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, I Two points that I want to touch on that I think are related because I think you draw them together toward the, <clears throat> towards the end of your presentation and just to see if, if you could flesh them out a little more. And the first is the idea of talking about the names of the demons of the body, that these have this therapeutic value to you. Seems to me almost to be an obvious point because to have power over those parts of the body would be to know their names, yeah. right? That that the assertion of, of the names is in order to exercise power over the body for, for the benefit of the body. So I think that that's a, a really important and, and insightful point. But I, I think also, I'm, I, I'm having to refer to my own notes because I think what you were putting together is, a, is such a, a precise and sophisticated point that silence is this mode of concealing, revealing. Right? And so you'll forgive my Heideggerian language here. Well, right, well. That, that there is this concealing revealing that is the mode of the coming to pass is true. Well, well. And, and the idea that something is hidden in silence, I think, 
points to the inability of language to express the spiritual truths. And I wonder if that's sort of what you're seeing in there, that, that we need something beyond simply propositional language in order to talk about these spiritual truths. Is, is that sort of what you're gesturing toward there? Or? Um, I think there, there are, I think the text, I, I think, okay, so this is me from now on, okay, what, but I think the text is making an argument that even its own story is ultimately inadequate. Mm -hmm. You know, that, you know, that, y you know, the, the s stories are just so incredibly important to us. You know, stories are necessary and they are life-giving. And, and we, we tell them, we tell them, we tell them to get them right, to, to get them true, and we always feel that <laughs> not quite. The, not, let's revise that a little bit. Let's fix that a little bit. You know, but it, it's also the, the 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 case. So I think this text does work against certain kinds of dogma, and it's it. There are other texts, as you know, um, uh, from the 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 Sethian Gnostics or from Nag Hammadi and so forth. The Gospel of Philip, which is a Valentinian text, you know, that has very explicit, you know, teaching about the um, that. The truth in this world is revealed by names. It can't come into the world any other way. And yet those names are also deceptive. See, and so th that's probably the most explicit teaching about how language is necessary and it's inadequate at the same time. Um, and so I think the Gospel of John, uh, the, the Apocrypha of John has something similar going on. Um, in what, it's, in, in what it's trying to do. But at core, okay, there is, there is this commitment to the, the absolute transcendence of God and of deity, you know, and to its inevitability and unknowability. And yet, and yet at the same time, the requirement to be known. So again, um, one is, what, that's why I think the practice of silence, you know, is, is for this text is somehow a really core kind of spiritual spiritual practice. You know, not only telling the story and you know, um, you know, uh, you know, it, it, the Savior talks in here about about um, about purification and about overcoming sin and, and so on and so forth. And I, you know, you know, pulling away from the things of this world. It's, I think all of those things, those those kinds of as cases, you know. Um, about the world are about trying to get what's real and not real right, you know, trying to embody them and living out. So they're, they are themselves not ends in themselves and not even dogmatic, but they are, but they are modes of going through life to, to try to see where, where life, where the real life is, mm. you know, and, and sin is the name for, for oh, got that wrong, mm. you know. As, as opposed to like a, a list that we can compose, you know, like who, oh, I was going to say who can use what bathroom, but you know, but anyway, <laughs> but, you know, but as opposed to a list we can compose, yeah. So I don't know if that, if that addresses your... Uh, the, the wonderful, thank you very much. I think what's beautiful about what you just said, um, when you're talking about the, the, the ways in which secrecy is used, I think your second point is about sort of encouraging a, a critical mind in the yes, reader right, to, exactly. to look at life and okay. scripture and everything. Yep. From the point you just made, it's, a, it's also kind of a skesis as a, as a way to adopt a, a critical distance from your, your embodied experience and not to take that as a given, but to kind of breathe a little air into what's yeah. going on with your body and kind of how you interpret it. Maybe? Yeah, it's, that's that's a really interesting formulation. I probably wouldn't have put the distance with the body in there. I think the, I think that it's that this text is trying to teach an active, intellectual, critical engagement with the world. You know that it, that it has that aspect mm -hmm. as well. The body. Um, there's so much interesting work being done in the academy on the body, and mostly mostly it's. Mostly, it's clothed in a lot of jargon right now, but 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 people are moving, oh, are trying to get away from the body mind dualism thing, okay, which everybody is doing, okay, with medicine and so forth. But in doing that, it's it's what is that distance from, you know, is it distance 
that one is getting on the body, or is it, or is it a way of encountering the way the world comes at us? Mm. You know, the, what what hits me? Okay, which which might be your smile, you know, when I when I come in, or it might be your disdain, <laughs> you know, and those things will change my body. You know, they will have an effect on my body. So it's a it's a way of trying again. Um, to to engage our embodied that we are embodied, but but to understand the body as something that extends past the skin in our materiality that we're not enclosed, airtight things. We're involved in a situation. Yes. In the world. Yeah, and and so that's so the the powers that rule the world have real power over our bodies. Okay, in ideas that are there. You know, and, and you know, in attitudes and emotions that come up. So, racism, sexism, these are classic, right? But there are all kinds of ways um, in which the world comes at us. And those can help with flourishing, or those can be really destructive, or anything in between. You know? yeah. So do you think that the silence specifically that it, it speaks of is, is more like a meditative type of silence? To allow the, the truth to to come in, and also when you meditate, you're noticing what's going on with your body. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're cognizant yeah. Yeah. of the all. So, do you feel that that's the silence that this text is speaking of? So, uh, I think the text is annoyingly silent mm -hmm. about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it would be great if it would really. You know, I think one could one could think what what were those practices of silence? Would they be like meditation? You know, what kind of meditation? You know, um, you know, mindfulness kinds of things, or you know, Buddhist practices. What it, you know, what, what those are. But um, it doesn't say. But it wants to. It is this pushing past language, and and the 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 thing that again is important for me in thinking about language in antiquity is that um, there really isn't the kind of differentiation between emotions and thinking that we often put those into, you know, the, in two different buckets, you know. I used to hate it when they would ask you, are you more a thinking person or a feeling person? <laughs> and I would say, want to hear me yell at you in perfect? <laughs> what is that, right, you know? Um, so that's, that silence is not a getting rid of, of intellectuality, you know, to go for emotion, feeling. It's something else. Okay. Um, but I'm not very good at that, so and the so text is not very, it's not really good. Sure. Okay. Sure? Okay. Okay. Um, on the one trick pony question guide, we, we've had the good fortune to have uh, uh, many great speakers uh, over the over the years, and I'm, I'm honored to to have you here. Because we've had uh, uh, the apocryphal John as a theme over the last few years, and uh, uh, we first started off a, a series with, where we had Dr. Berger Pearson and then uh, Dr. Plasia. So I've asked them the same question. I've been asking the same question. So I'm going to throw out the same question I asked the two of them. Um, and this is my own curiosity. I mean, we're not a very dogmatic organization we don't we everybody's interpretation you know is their own and so scriptures uh, uh, presented for myth and symbol rather than doctrine and dogma is an opportunity for reflection but I'm still obviously curious from my own point of view to to hear what the the, the great thinkers think about it and the uh, question I asked them was this is um, the universe of the worldview of the apocryphal form do you view it as uh, uh, being dualistic, monistic, or a qualified version of either of those two. So, did you all hear the question back there? That's the way. That's the way we we <laughs> pause. <laughs> don't let me repeat. Why'd you repeat that? But no. Okay. Um, you can ask for a drink of water too. <laughs> so ultimately, ultimately, um, it's monistic. You know, but it's a kind of it's a particular kind of transcendent monism. Yeah. But it plays off on the notion uh, again of 
I, I, I think it's, a, it's moving toward a Neoplatonic sorts of understanding of what constitutes monism. So, you know, the move from the one to the many is yeah. a classical problem in Greek thought, right? Yeah. And, you know, you move from the one to the two. Yeah. So this, is, this text is making those moves, you know? Now, when, often when people use the language of dualism, especially with regard to Gnosticism, yeah. they really want to see these as ontological differences. And there's no basis for an ontologically e existent evil over against an ontologically existent good in this text. There isn't, you know. Where do you um, think that comes from? The, 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 ontolog the people who want to find an ontological dualism in Gnosticism, because I don't see it either. I, well, okay, so if I'm nice, what I'll say? We can kill the video. I don't name names. But so, um, one does look at something like the revelation of John uh, the Apocalypse of John in the New Testament, right? And it sets up these really strong um, dualisms, right? Mm -hmm. And the text doesn't ultimately resolve them. The, the Apocalypse of John, you know, puts Satan in hell forever, but that doesn't cease to exist. You might get an order in, right? So there are ways in, in which Christianity has some forms of Christianity at some times have deeply imbibed of, of this kind of dualism. But the dualism philosophically in Christian theology cannot be an ontological dualism, ultimately. But Christianity has this problem of where do you get evil from, you know? Um, and so, you know, that this, yeah, because then you have to make God the source of good and evil, you know? and. One of the texts from Nagamati, the testimony, you know, the apocalypse of Peter, thinks that the biggest problem is with those who say good and evil come from one source. So there, so there is a critique of a particular kind of, of monism going on very early in the tradition, and an insistence upon a dualism that you have to, you have to have good and evil. You can't just say they're, they're undifferentiated. But that good and evil tends often, often uh, to be epistemological, knowledge and ignorance. It's moral. I've been using good and evil in a kind of moral sense, um, life and death, you know, these kinds of, of qualitative uh, sorts of notions. Now, why is it that Gnosticism gets, gets touched with dualism, okay? Um, as you know, I don't usually use that word, Gnosticism, okay? <laughs> but I'm using it, okay? But I'm using it now as the label that is used by people who want to say this stuff is heretical. Mm -hmm. So if you step inside of that discourse, okay, um, people want to argue that Gnostics hate the body, but true Christians are body loving. You know? Because <laughs> we see that all the time. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, because we see that all the time. Okay, so, so it, really is a, it really is a rhetoric of heresy. You know, and you you see it a lot, and you continue to see it a lot, and we see it in our own society. But you you know you you know you, you track it up to different kinds of things. But you know you, you just have to read the newspaper. You know, I mean, you could spend the rest of your life doing the rhetoric of the newspaper on such issues. So I think that the it's it's important to understand the the philosophical problems that are that are raised by a particular kind of intellectualizing, and and um, and the rhetorical strategies of othering, and those are not the same. Mm -hmm. Did, did that answer your question? Yes. Great. Um, yes. What about um, we talk about the um, use of power and of totalitarian um, societies in the world? Uh, what is how is the uh, origin of it addressed? Does it seem I mean, would you say it's purely um, within the uh, lower realms, or is there an analog within the higher realms and the hypostases yeah. and their creation of the universe? You know, are, are the um, lower spirits and beings simply reflecting um, the, the hypostases 
and the archons above. Yeah. No, I, I think that's right. You know, did you all hear that? You know, could you could you repeat your question to the first? No, I'm not going for time. I really want you to. Okay. <laughs> oh, I was asking about the relationship between power control and um, the different levels of being. And if the power struggles within uh, mundane earthly societies like Rome, it, uh, do they come from uh, a purely a lower source of spiritual being, or is there an analog within the uh, upper realms of the archons? Yeah. So I actually think that this is um, it's like a war in heaven too. Yeah. yeah. This is um, this is the place where where. Where I would where I've gone for critique of the secret revelation of John, the Apocrypha of John, because it seems to me that the the the, the ideal is the divine realm, and that the ideal of the divine realm is precisely used to criticize and to critique power in the lower realm. But if you just look at the divine realm above, it is very much a totalitarian mm -hmm. regime. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got one god at the top, and anybody who's not in, in co total and complete harmony with that is out of sync and subject to death and evil. I mean, Sophia is a perfect example, you know, of a figure who is um, uh, of the divine realm, but, but she acts out of the good to do good things, but is out of sync and didn't, and it says specifically, didn't have permission. So power is operating in a really top down kind of way. And the, the language about, about God in this text is very, very much um, an ancient Roman totalitarian kind of language. Okay, so here's what I did. Okay, so if you look at the versions of the, of the of, um, you know, we have four different copies of the Apocrypha of John. Two longer, two shorter. Okay, so in the, in the short, version of which we have the best copy from the Berlin Codex, okay. Okay, well, let me back up. So, as, as you probably do, and as many people do, one reads Sophia as a kind of an Eve figure, you know, so that the, the fall of, this is why I read what happens in the divine realm as this Genesis story, because then Eve, then, then Sophia becomes the, the Eve who has the fall, right, and who is, and who brings about, you know, um, everything bad, okay? And so she's a kind of an eighth figure, and she has to repent, and then she gets incorporated back in. Fine, good, okay? But what they do with even the lower realm is they've got this, they've got this um, movement going on where what happens with Adam and Eve and with Sophia in the lower realm is to critique the world ruler's power, right? And so you see in the, the uh, short version the sentence that the subordination of women to men is against the plan of the holy height. Now we go back to Sophia and go like, really? <laughs> she got into trouble because she didn't obey her male partner. She wasn't in harmony with her male partner. Okay, harmony's good, I like harmony. I can be in harmony, okay. But didn't obey the divine father. So this looks a whole lot like the critique that's being waged against the world ruler below, to me. And um, that, for me, is a crack. That, to me, is an exploitable crack in the system to take it back up and, and do this. And I think they recognized it, because if you look at the long version of the Secret Revelation of John, they've fixed it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, and so you don't get, you don't get that strong statement that the subordination of women to men is counter. You, you get this, like, she was, she was, uh, adorning herself for her husband. Okay, so like that's just not as strong a statement to me. <laughs> you know, so it makes her complicit somehow. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And they move. Yeah. So, uh, I, so I do think that that is not just a modern. Uh, there isn't just not just a modern sensibility, but there was you know some tension. Do you think that represents well. tension within a community that? That, that's developing these texts? Or? I think that ideas and stories always have practical implications on the ground for real people's real lives. And that they're not, you know, and fantasy is no exception. <coughs> Imagination is no exception. D did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Did you, did you okay. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. I was wondering, uh, 
So what we were just talking about there, it is uh, the father always conceived of as male, or is it sometimes progenitor, or not specifically? Because that solves that problem. Okay, so does the, can I reframe your question? Yes. So does the, um, the ineffability of the one solve the problem of male and female? Arguably, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> because of, okay, the, the question for me, and we've been, we've been um, uh, struggling with this in my Gospel of Mary class, this term, whether gender is, um, as they would say in antiquity, adiaphora, you know, whether it is one of those things that doesn't make a difference ultimately for spiritual well-being or not. But in the Apocrypha of John, you have a lot of gendered language in the divine realm. And that the ineffable one is called father, you know? And so you got the father, mother, son. You have this patriarchal household. I'm always wondering, where are the daughters, you know? <laughs> you, get, you get wives sort of in the pairing, so to speak. But anyway, never mind me. But you know, so. The question would be, does that resolution into the one, is that a resolution into a state of genderlessness, which would be then the ideal? So that's my maybe on the one side. Or is it an acknowledgement that the male-female resides within the one? As does all, um, as potentially does all plenitude, is within the one. So gender fullness. Yes. Or there's there's that beguiling title for Babylon, the mother mm -hmm. Baba. Yeah. yeah. At one point. Yes. See, they're trying to they're tr they're trying to push that that's in that's in the longer version. The longer version is trying to push a little bit more ineffability and uh, into the into the highest God than you see in the Berlin Codex. Mm -hmm. Is that just with like are there other texts that um, take it in one direction or another that are supporting this historically uh, or? Uh, different strengths that have, that have popped up around it that have had influence. That are taking what? The, the measure of God? Yeah, you know, the, the gender uh, that I see. So the question was, are there other places or other texts I know of that, that are taking this question about the gendering or non-gendering of the divine places? Mm -hmm. um, yes. So the, the pushback, it seems to me, uh, is the pushback, it seems to me, in early Christian literature, well, arguably the Gospel of Mary does this. The Gospel of Mary refers to God only as the good. It's the only name used for, for God in the text. Okay. And arguably, the text is arguing that gender distinctions of male and female written on bodies um, those, those physi that physical flesh, you know, dissolves back into that from which it came, uh, and the soul is itself therefore non-gendered. This is over against somebody like Tertullian who insists that souls are gendered and will forever, you know, male souls will be superior to female souls by nature and essence. That's it. Then there's also the problem of resolving the mini back into the one and loss of identity. Because this doesn't feel like salvation to hardly anybody. You know, there's some, you know, maintenance of, of something, okay? But mostly what happens, I think, that again, is that the maintenance of gender, even in the resurrected life, you know, um, is a mirror for practice now. And there's a, there's a really, gender does so much work in our society around, in human society, around almost every sphere one can think of, whether it's from the metaphorical, you know, to, to birthing or what, you know, that to give it up is to, is, and, and to neutralize it, um, is to engage so many different realms at once that it's too usable. Well, so anyway, maybe I'm got, cynical. Whenever you've got two things. Yeah. One of them's always got to be masculine, one of them's always got to be feminine. It's really, it's parsimonious. I was going to suggest that there's, and there's also the possibility, like uh, as Grace said, that you know, uh, it could simply be the, it, it could be a, a case of reconciling the ineffable versus the individuals in the community at the time who have to communicate. 
communicate that. I mean, there's numerous instances in scripture from something in Thomas to where, you know, I'm incapable of saying what you're like to the apocalypse of John, you know, and the I'm not going to write what the seven fingers say, you know, and all these things where um, the reality and how you record that on paper might entirely be, you know, and, and you that also, problems as old as, as yeah, you've got to put it in a language that your readers can understand, and maybe that's what they got. I don't know. I mean, did you have ideas, Grace, that you were thinking of when you asked this question? Um, no, I was curious about it because, as you pointed out, can you all hear her back there? When people make a point, could you, of could you just, speak up, just, Shana. just shout? Yeah, when people make a point of differentiating, um, as you said, a male and female soul, they're generally doing it to disparage one of them. <laughs> when it <laughs> Yes. Which well, on it. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, to disparage the female. Yes, yeah. exactly. The effort is never made to gender the spiritual unless it's to cast part of it down a part or remove um, like rights or powers. If that isn't in play outside of the realm of creation, specifically, it's associating with like um, you know very very sort of generative type things outside of that specific thing. It doesn't seem to appear the necessity to separate masculine and feminine ideals and ideas and the spiritual doesn't seem to appear when equality is assumed. So when uh, when it's important to specify something as a mother or a father, as opposed to a circumstance of language being, you know, it's, it's supposed to include everything, that's just how the language was used, yeah. or a translation, yeah. generalization, and knowing that actually makes, as a woman, knowing that, oh, when we translate it from the languages, this is a, a, a unisex term, but we just use father because English at the time, it was just convenient, that's a big difference to be told, ah, it's a circumstance of translation versus, no, it absolutely must be enough for these reasons because, you know, this is what the intent is spiritually, and I, I think it's incredibly important to define those differences, um, because there's a lot of loaded intent behind those differences. Yeah. yeah. No, and someone was telling me that, that you know, we were, we were talking about these issues, that, um, that really the work that's being done in transgender stuff has such significant implications for theology. You know, because of the way of, because of the of the gendered language used about God, and if one if one moves sociologically <coughs> and medically and other kinds of ways to uh, other conceptions of of sex, gender, sexuality, et cetera, et cetera, you know, then this has this has real implications that run pretty deep, and this is why you know, okay, now I'm speaking on a turn again, but this is why the bathroom controversy is 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 a big deal because even though in fact nobody is, is being harmed and it's a non-issue if there ever was one you know it's it's not and the people who are pursuing it um, have have this sense that a whole bunch is at stake for them mm -hmm. although I not heard any real clear articulation you know, of what is at stake for them. So there's a lot of kind of moving out of the gut, or it's a, or it's little a of that, investment or so. little of that strategic concealment, or something. <laughs> going on. I don't know, but you we're, know, we're back to secrecy and reveal. Well, we got ignorance, we've got concealment, we've got strategies, we got. <laughs> but yeah, it's just we do. Uh, to to kind of basic questions, but uh, when I look at a lot of ancient texts from the the, the area. Um, uh, and when I say, when I see them talking about rape and sexual violence, they usually don't seem too concerned about it in a moral sense. There's this idea that rape is bad, but then, and I'm, I'm out of my field, I'm not an expert. Uh, I don't exactly know, but I, I haven't seen a lot of texts when they talk about rape being bad. It's bad because um, it's violating a man's property, right? It's bad because it's bro broken the bounds of marriage. It's bad because you raped the festal virgin, hence you took away her potency and her, her oath. It does the Apocrypha of John, um, when it's talking about the sexual violence, is it making more of a moral, it's bad to rape? What would you say? And, oh, sorry, and I'm very, very, I'm going to quickly shout out my second question. Uh, when other people in the ancient world uh, come across, came across the Apocrypha of John, would it be obvious to them that, that this is a critique of, of power structures on Earth? Those are my, or would it be, would you have to be in the know and read between the lines and the fact that? Okay, so. 
to, to, um, to take your last question first. Okay. You know, would readers in antiquity know that this was a critique of power relations in the world? The Romans were putting Christians to death for a reason. Yeah. They got something, you know. It may have been at the level of the bathroom, okay, issue, you yeah, know. But, but they, they, got, they got something there, that there was something serious about this story or these kinds of stories, you know. And so, yes, I think that somebody who, re who, who read and understood took the time to understand it, you know. Um, um, it's, it's, it also cloaks itself in a lot of difficulty to get in, you know. Um, probably more for us than for them, but still, you know. So, yes, I think they would. Uh, and I, I think the fact that, that even insiders would change certain kinds of things meant that they understood the implications of different parts of the story, too. You know, the additions and various kinds of things going on. So they're smart, yeah. You know, we, we, you know, we didn't make this up. The other point was what? Oh, about sexual violence. Ah, yes. Yeah. What would they think of rape? Well, in the secret revelation of John, the whole point of the, of the rape of women is just to talk about deception and the generation of the flesh continuing, you know, who are not part of the success. So um, there's nothing there that condemns rape as such. It's almost a hand waving in order to explain how the counterfeit spirits got there in the first place. So, yeah. Oh well, yeah. Well, we have these counterfeit spirits. How did they get there? Ah, uh, rape. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> or it's a, you know, as we've seen in you know, various, because it's been debated about various current television sure. shows about whether or not it's a, a bad plot device. Yeah. To just m to move the story in a certain mm -hmm. direction, kind of. Well, it seems more it's like saying like your 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 lineage is your is your property and your pride and it's being violated. It's like yeah. it, it, the the mode in which is the circumstance central non people in your uh, ownership, but the, uh, the 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 point being that your blood and your name is being like, violated. Yeah. Yeah. But there is this there is a distinction in the text between rape, you know, um, which it talks about explicitly, you know, um, and what children are produced out of that rape, you know, um, and uh, and desire. Okay, so so there is this you know negative lust. I mean, when they talk about the the world ruler, you know, copulates with irre unreason to produce. Okay, so this is this is bad sex. Okay, you know, and then you have you know the father above who intellectually recognizes the divine in another and out of that plenitude brings forth, which is how the, so you get the sex between the rape of Eve is sort of this bad stuff and the production of Seth is the good, okay? But in the middle of that, I, uh, I often point out to my, t t to my women readers, but to readers that, um, that Eve, after her rape, is not considered to be defiled. She still is, Adam is still able to see in her the perfection of the divine. And I think that's a, that's a takeaway message you rarely find, you know, um, that the rape won't, you know. The other text is the, is the hypothesis of the archons, you know, where on the one hand, the raped body of Eve is deserted by the text, and she's raped many times, and even her daughter, Norea, pushes her to the side and says, she's not my real mother. So there is a, there is a, a real denigration in the text of that. At the same time that the, that the world rulers who, who rape her are, are condemned thoroughly for, and it is acknowledged as solely an act of power and not of one of sexuality. So you get, a, you get again, you know, for me, amb ambivalent kinds of readings about what, where you want to put your foot and what, what kinds of, uh, you know, yeah, what one wants to do with, with those, different, those different pieces. Um, if I could go off topic just for a bit, and I know Jonathan will yell at me for asking this question now, uh, but, um, can you give us your thoughts on the uh, the word Gnosticism as a category? Yes, I can give you my thoughts on the word Gnosticism as a category. <laughs> it is a category that was invented, I think, in you know, in the what do we say, the 18th century? I've got the date in my book somewhere. I always forget it. 
but um, uh, to you know pull together all of these kinds of, of heresies under one umbrella. So it's a modern, the ism, when we get an ism, you've got a modern category, which isn't to say that they didn't have categories of heresy and antiquity. So, but, but when they put this together in the modern period, they, have you heard my three bears views of Christian history, typology? Um, does everybody know the three bears story? The porridge, the oh, bed, yeah. the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, those three bears, yes. So, um, they categorized Christianity into three types based on the relationship to Judaism. So, one kind of heresy is Jewish Christianity that's too much Judaism and too positive. Okay? <laughs> Gnosticism is too little Judaism and too negative. <laughs> and orthodoxy is just that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in some ways, in that kind of categorization, the, the real point is with the relationship of Christianity to Judaism, you know, and how, how Jewish scriptures are read, and, and the, the Christian appropriation and reading of, you know, um, of, of Tanakh, basically. Um, but, so I, I think it's important not to, to use that term. On the other hand, you know, scholars are saying, well, what are we going to call this stuff? And my argument has been, in the first instance, let's call it Christianity. And then in the second instance, we can talk about different types of Christianity. So if you want to talk about Johannine Christianity and Pauline Christianity, you can talk about Sethian's Christianity and Valentinian Christianity. But let's realize that, we're, that we have this capacious umbrella and not repeat in modern, under the guise of, you know, of objective historiography, to actually, you know, repeat the exclusion of certain texts and types from um, from Christianity, and it makes no sense historically to do so in the early period anyway. So I often think of the early period as a place when you can make a list of things that early Christians and ancient peoples generally, human beings, but Christians were were talking about, and and then you can see the various answers to them and which ones came to have a dominant place and which ones didn't. The very little in the Nakamani writings was actually tossed out of normative Christianity in some form or other as it came forward. The view that the creator god of, the, of Genesis is a bad guy is one idea that got tossed. That's the one that, that simply has not had legs. But look at how important Satan is. Mm -hmm. You know, so it isn't, it isn't that you don't have a bad you know, world ruler with his minions. You do. Okay. He's just not. He's just not the creator of this world. And that's not unimportant either. Yeah. Although we still get the, the title prince of this world. Yes. Same. Yeah. You bet. We have to overthrow the prince of this world, whether they be Russian or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Do you think that has something to do with um, there being different kinds of demiurges for each of the realms? Like a higher ineffable demiurge and then a more noleric demiurge and then a sublunar demiurge. I haven't thought about that. Huh. Do you? Um, I've been reading uh, Jeffrey Coverman's book recently, uh, Living Thirty, and it goes into uh, the idea of there being different demiurges for each of the realms of existence. And the, um, the lowest level of um, creation had a demiurge watching over it. And I think. Was it Porphyry? I think Porphyry or Plutarch might have um, equated um, Pluto or Hades with the sublunar demiurge. Yeah, Plutarch, yeah. So the question is, are there different demiurges at different it's levels yeah. of existence? Oh, it is Yambicus. Yeah, it's it's okay. Ambicus? Doesn't... Okay. I think. I, I, at least that's what... I'm not standing... Jeffrey, who knows these things yep. a lot better than I can. Yeah. No, I'm not standing by my Plutarch. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not standing by that either, but I think that's it. We have time. Somebody said it. <laughs> <laughs> we have time? We have time. Because I have 45 questions. <laughs> <laughs> Should we ask if there's anybody in the back who has things to... Anybody hasn't asked a question yet? Who's 
sitting on something. There seems to be a line of silence draped across, yeah. which could be a positive thing. You, know? you, you could just be more ineffable and spiritually advanced back <laughs> Has anybody got a question where you're sitting there thinking, oh, that's, uh, that's probably not an important question. Maybe it's the most important question. Or a comment or criticism or anything, just ideas. Great. Or not. Or not. Go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> By default, um, the uh, the text talks about those um, uh, the I, I don't I don't know exactly what to call them, but like traps of, of physical incarnation, wealth and lust and and those kinds of things. Um, I always kind of picture this text as as a you know for, a text for initiates of whatever this you know yeah. this community is, and so. Um, this to me is one of the hints as to this is how we behave. You know, we're, we're, this is our asceticism specifically. Um, and uh, what are your feelings on the, what may have been the ritual practices of the group that used this text? Uh, you, maybe do you have any thoughts on what the five seals might have been or any of that kind of thing or what their asceticism might have looked like? I think that the so the questions about the what is the asceticism of the text might look of the Pakistan might look like and also what kind of ritual practices, especially the five seals. So that um, so I think that the, the text has a has a pretty sharp um, argument against wealth, um, against uh, eating too much food, you know, gluttony. Really, I mean, uh, uh, against. A desire when desire is characterized as violence and as overweening desire to dominate others especially for the inferior to dominate the superior you know um, uh, and it, you know it, it has that one passage that that talks about the, the counterfeit spirit you know and bringing people into labor and, and work and well, and despair yeah, it's this very moving passage, really. Um, so I, I think it, 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 it has a pretty strong social ethics on those regards. And they're not that different from some other people in degree. Um, the ritual practice for the secret revelation of John and for Sethians generally is baptism. Um, and the, you know, the five seals are often considered to be the seals of the rise of the soul against the planetary powers, you know, as one ascends. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't find that, again, played out very much. But what you find the Gospel of, uh, the Apocryphon of John talking about the theology of baptism, it really locates it first above with the, the water of light that is productive for receiving the spirit. So I think that that it's possible to imagine that people were doing this, that there was a sense of the light image, or even uh, one of my students has suggested the use of a mirror mm -hmm. or a mirrored image, you know, um, for the, that's most of the gospel folk, but the use of this light, light as a reflection, right, on water, um, as, as a, a practice of, that is, um, I don't always use the word imitation, but that is in line with the the original productive power of, of, of the divine one. And then the way in which then the light is on the water below, and you get again the imaging of the above on the below on the water. And then finally, you know, the the, the seals, which could be an part of a baptismal ritual of chrism as well, and not have to do with dippings, for example, but perhaps anointings with oil. Um, and of course, there, the, the final pronoia him at the end of the text is really, really important, you know, where she seals, you know, the soul who's weeping, who has seen me, who knows my name, who calls to me in this darkness, you know, and weeps, you know, and she seals. Um, with the vices that protects him from the powers of the world below. So here also is what we know from other Christian texts where baptism is also a protection against the de demonic violation. You know, and so you can see in this text both in the naming of the, of the parts of the body that belong to the demons for healing and exorcism, but also in baptism, you know, the strong sense that you get throughout antiquity about, um, about the power of demons to harm. 
So I think we might wrap up. Tony, if you could hold your other 44 questions and then we can talk about them over a cup of coffee. Cool. <laughs> um, brothers and sisters, let us thank Dr. Karen King. Oh, thank you.